Okay, today I'm going to explain to you and Woofy, who has to be by daddy's side all the time, why a brain cannot be a digital computer. This is actually a new proof. You've never seen it before. And I'm going to explain to you why it can't be the case that the brain can store all of the possible states that are required to handle human consciousness. So first, let me point out, the human brain has something like 100 billion neurons, which is sort of interesting. Uh, I don't know why that number seems to be kind of magic. On average, there are something like 100 billion stars per galaxy. And I think there's something like 100 billion galaxies in the universe. So it's an interesting coincidence. So the first argument I'm going to make is that the brain cannot be a digital computer with neurons acting as bits. Now, most neuroscientists and computer scientists don't actually make this argument, but but I think it's still interesting and valid to point out why it can't be the case that the brain is a digital computer with neurons as bits. More realistically, what people generally believe is that if the brain were a digital computer, then each of the neurons has on average about a thousand synapses, connections to other neurons, and the strength of each of these synaptic connections can be represented by say eight bits something like that, something of that order of magnitude. So if that's true, then it's generally kind of believed by neuroscientists and computer scientists that something like this, you know, the, the brain has, say, 100 billion neurons, an average of 1,000 synapses per neuron, and then something on the order of eight bits per synapse to specify a digital brain state. So if you just multiply these together, what you see is that it's something on the order of one peta bit, which is 10 to the 15th bits, something in that order of magnitude. So what I'm going to show is, first of all, that neurons can't be bits themselves. But second of all, that even this is inadequate to store the information that the brain must store in order to support human consciousness. It's a brand new proof. You've never seen it before. Okay. So I want to talk about what is a conscious state? Well, of course, that's debatable, but I know that I'm conscious right now. And something else that I know is that my conscious awareness is affected by the stimuli that I receive through, at the very least, my five senses. I suspect that there's also an effect directly from the brain that causes uh, other sensations, which is the reason that if you're in a sensory deprivation tank, so that none of your five senses are actually being stimulated, you can still have very interesting thoughts during that process process because you're stimulated by the brain itself. But for the moment, let's just limit ourselves to the five senses. So I know that my conscious state right now is at the very least affected by, maybe not fully determined by, but at least affected by stimuli from those five senses. And information in the universe is always finite. So what I can do is kind of figure out how much information is necessary to specify every, I call it sort of a frame of conscious state. So I'm going to call this a stimulus frame. And what I mean by that is I don't know how much information is necessary to specify my conscious state right now, but I know that I am getting information from at the very least my five senses. And those can be broken down into really, really short segments, short enough that I can't distinguish anything shorter and then kind of go from there. So each one of those will be called a stimulus frame. Now, how long is a stimulus frame? Well, you're watching this video probably at 30 frames per second. And the reason for that, as opposed to five or a million, is because a million takes up too much information. We don't need it beyond 30. But if you start getting a lot lower than 30, we can distinguish choppiness or weirdness in the video. If you get, if you, if you look at a video that's only at 10 frames per second or five frames per second, you'll know it doesn't seem like a seamless, continuous video. So our conscious states, let's just estimate that for this purpose, we just want to be order of magnitude. Let's say that each individual conscious state lasts something like, say, a tenth of a second. And so each stimulus frame then is a string of information. We're going to call it bits 
You could represent it in decimal or hexadecimal or whatever it is you want, but we're gonna represent it in binary, string of bits, information that represent the stimuli that I get for any given frame, and we're gonna assume something like 10 frames per second. So what I wanna do is actually count, not with my fingers, but I wanna count the number of possible distinguishable conscious states. Now, what is a distinguishable conscious state? So what I mean by distinguishable is that if you have a stimulus frame, which includes visual information, auditory information, tactile information, if a person consciously perceives that stimulus frame and you were to slightly change so that the next stimulus frame is just slightly different, maybe out of the corner of your eye, instead of you know, your peripheral vision, instead of seeing whatever color you happen to see, I'm seeing a light yellow. If all of a sudden there was a little black blip, which maybe might be a bug or an ant or something like that, would I perceive that? Well, yeah, I mean, so the idea is that we can make very tiny changes to the information in a given stimulus frame and that could result in a consciously perceptible difference. That is a distinct conscious state. Now, does it mean I have to notice it? No, I mean, there actually might be a fly over there right now, but I'm paying attention to the video. So maybe I don't consciously notice that difference right now, but that's not the question. The question is, could I possibly notice that out of the corner of my eye changing sort of a pixel in my vision, changing the color? And the answer is, yeah, as long as it's big enough, right? And the change is significant. If it's a very, very small change to a different yellow, maybe that wouldn't be consciously perceptible. And maybe if it did turn black, which would be very different from the light yellow, but it was really small, then maybe that would not be consciously distinguishable. But what I want to know is how many consciously distinguishable stimulus frames can there possibly be? Well, we can actually just do the math. I think it's very interesting. I've never seen it done before. All right, I'm gonna start by considering a particular stimulus frame, and I'm gonna call it time T1. At time T1, a person consciously perceives this, and that is watching a sunset while hearing crashing waves, while tasting red wine, while smelling salty air, and feeling sand under one's feet. So my point is I've listed the five senses that we have, seeing, hearing, tasting, smelling, and tactile sensations. And so the question I have is, what is the minimum amount of information required to specify this? I think it's a fascinating question. So the first thing we'll do, I mean, you would suspect that probably visual information, especially for humans, maybe not so much for dogs. For dogs, smelling probably gives them more information and requires more information to specify than visual information, but certainly for humans, visual information is probably, you would think, the most dominant for the amount of information required to specify it. Let's look at visual. Let's consider a 1080p video. And what that actually means is, 1920 by 1080 pixels, and then each one of those, each one of those pixel elements, those picture elements has three colors, and generally it's accepted, it's believed that we can distinguish something like eight bits worth of information per color, because we can actually see, we can distinguish millions of different colors. So this by itself, when you multiply it out, actually gives you almost 50 million bits by itself. Well, you might complain and say, okay, yeah, but that's just way too much information. If you're watching a big screen TV at this resolution, you're not gonna notice in the periphery the changing of one of those pixels to a slightly different color. And that's probably true. And we know that because there are compression algorithms that are used to compress visual information and also sound information. Visual could be like an MP4 compression algorithm. Auditory could be an MP3 compression algorithm. What's interesting about those is that, is that they were actually created, not from any a priori information about the universe, but it had to be compared to what humans are actually able to consciously distinguish and perceive. In other words, if you take this amount, this number of bits, and remember this is per frame, and so if there's 30 frames a second, you can imagine how quickly this adds up. This is the raw data. What a compression algorithm does, 1080p can very easily be compressed to eight megabits per second, 
And if there are about 30 frames per second, then this corresponds to about 267,000 bits. So you can see there's already a massive decrease in the number of bits necessary to specify a given frame of visual information. But you know, we can even be more conservative and say, okay, well, let's kind of take the worst compression algorithm and then shave it off even more. So let's just, just for the sake of argument, let's just divide this by 10. So let's just say that actually the amount of information necessary to specify a stimulus frame at a given moment to produce a conscious state and just the visual aspect of it, let's just say that this goes to something like 25,000 bits, okay? Okay, next let's look at audio. Well, the thing about audio is unlike a photograph, you can just look at a photograph. You can freeze a frame of a video and that's a photograph, right? You can just look at it. It can exist by itself. A sound wave can't exist by itself. A sound wave literally is motion. It is motion at a high frequency or a medium frequency or a low frequency. Any given sound is actually a superposition of lots of different waves on top of each other. So it doesn't really make sense to speak of a consciously distinct frame of sound in the way that it's currently sampled. So the way that sound is sampled is this. We can hear something like as low as 20 hertz. That means 20 cycles per second. So we can hear something like 20 hertz to something like 20,000 hertz on that order. And the idea, if you want to break audio information down digitally, you have to sample it. Well, you have to sample it faster than your fastest wave, right? I mean, if it's slower than this, then you can't catch this information, right? If you're sampling at 10 kilohertz, 10,000 cycles per second, you can't catch this 20 kilohertz information. You have to sample at least as fast as this, but realistically at least double that because you need to at least know when the peak and the trough of the wave are. So you need to know when this occurs, the peak and when the trough occurs. And notice that here's one wave right there. So that means you have to hit it at least twice per cycle. So your minimum sampling of audio has to be on the order of like 40,000 kilohertz. And, and indeed, that's what it is. It's generally something like 44K or 48K. So let's just assume that our sampling is at 48 kilohertz, 48,000 times a second. So getting back to the point about sound is motion, you can't see a note unless you're taking LSD, right? You can't see a single note or, or experience a single note. You can't hear a single note in no time because sound requires motion. It requires the changing in the pressure of the air molecules that are hitting your eardrum. So instead of talking about, we certainly could not distinguish 48,000 frames of sound per second. So let's just assume that conscious frames are comparable to visual. We already know that 30 frames a second is enough to fool us into thinking that a movie is continuous. 10 frames per second is not enough to fool us. So let's just assume again, we're, we're sort of on the same order of magnitude here. So let's say that really we need to break this sampling, which is 48,000 per second into 30 conscious frames per second. So what this really leads us to, if we divide this by 30, is about 1600 vibrations or waves per second. And then let's multiply this by the amount of information necessary to specify that particular wave. And that tends to be, you know, you could have like a 16-bit length, a 24-bit length, but let's say that you have 16 bits, that's going to come out to 25,000 bits. Look, it's the same as visual, but it's not actually because we, we haven't talked about compression of this. This is still basically the raw information data. So compression algorithms like MP3 take into consideration what the human ear and brain can actually consciously distinguish. So it turns out that most algorithms, and especially MP3, can reduce this information by at least a factor of 10 and often more. So really, it's not 25,000 bits per stimulus frame. Really, it's a tenth of that, so really it goes to about 2,500 bits per frame. Now, it turns out that was actually a pretty good estimate because, for example, if you do an MP3 compression to 96 kilobits per second and divide it by 30 frames per second, then what you end up getting is 3,200 bits per frame, which is real similar to what we found there. So this is sort of what we would expect 
from compression algorithms. But just like how before, the compression gave us 267,000 bits of visual information per frame, and then we divided it by 10 to be real conservative, we're gonna do the same thing here. So if the compression algorithm gives us something like 3,000 bits per conscious stimulus frame, we're gonna divide that by 10 again, and you see now we're only on the order of 300 bits per frame it's a small fraction of that, and that's not surprising because what we can consciously distinguish by seeing is significantly better than what we can by hearing. So for that reason, I'm just gonna erase what I've calculated for the audio because it's so small relative to the information necessary to specify visual information in a stimulus frame. I want an order of magnitude here, so I'm just gonna get rid of this. Okay, next, smell. I mean, for Woofy, she probably gets a lot of information from her little nose, a lot more than humans get. But having said that, recent research suggests that we are much better at differentiating smells than we ever thought. We used to think it was on the order of, you know, thousands or millions or something like that. But no, actually, it looks like we can distinguish at least one trillion, which is 10 to the 12th, smells. Seems like a lot, right? But actually, if you represent this in binary, this is something on the order of two to the 40th, right? Something like that, which means it only takes 40 bits to specify the information that we get in a stimulus frame from smell. And again, 40, this number right here, is significantly smaller than the number we got for visual of 25,000 bits per stimulus frame. So once again, we're gonna get rid of it. We're gonna ignore it. Taste, I couldn't find good data on taste, but taste and smell, you know, a, a good chef might be able to distinguish, you know, billions or even trillions of different tastes of things, but I'm just gonna say it's the same order of magnitude and for that reason, we'll just forget about it because 40 bits is nothing compared to 25,000 bits per stimulus frame. So we get rid of smell and taste. And the last one we have is touch or tactile information. Now at first I thought this would be relatively small, but then I did the math. So we can distinguish on our body, if I were to touch here and here at the same time, separated by about a centimeter, turns out I probably could distinguish it. I could feel two pokes. But if you get much closer, it becomes hard to do that. Different places on the body have different sensitivities. And so that distance that we can distinguish on our body is different throughout the body. Our lips, of course, are extremely sensitive. So that distance would be much smaller. And there is research to, to support this. Let's just say that on average, we can distinguish something like one centimeters worth of distance. I'll, you'll see where I'm going in a second. And then let's say that the surface area of the human body is something like one to two square meters. So if you were to pull out the skin like a rug and measure the total area of it, for most humans, it would be on this order. And so now you could sort of think of a grid of little spots like pixels on that skin, broken up with a distance of about one centimeter. Some places it's closer, some places it's further, but about one centimeter. So a pixel is a picture element. So a touch element might be a tackle or something. I don't know. But anyway, you get the idea. It's sort of a pixel for touch. And then you divide this by this. So a meter squared, convert that into centimeters squared, and you get 10,000. So this gives us something like 10,000 to 20,000 sort of pixels of touch. And now the question is, for each of those pixels, how much information is necessary to specify that particular touch? I think it's hard to figure out because there's a lot of elements to touch, right? There's how hard I press, right? I can press softly, or I can press hard at that point. It can be painful, that's slightly painful. If I press harder, that's more painful. Uh, it can be pleasurable, and there can be different kinds of pleasure and pain from skin. Oh yeah, I'm just gonna be conservative here and say it takes something like 10 bits to specify the actual value, sort of like the color in a picture. This would be sort of like the color or feeling of that tactile sensation. So let's multiply this by another 10, and what this tells tells us is that this is actually gonna require something like 100,000 to 200,000 bits of information per frame for tactile information. And I was being very conservative here. I was being very realistic, but also on the conservative side. So now you can see that when you compare these two, that touch might actually require more information per stimulus frame than visual, maybe. But for the rest of the analysis, what I'm gonna do is just assume that when you add up 
all of the information required to specify just the five senses, it's on the order of one to 200,000 bits per frame. And so what I'm also gonna do is call this, uh, this is the bit length L. And what I mean by that is that is the bit length, the number of bits necessary to specify a stimulus frame that is consciously distinguishable by the person experiencing it. Once again, it doesn't mean that the person actually experiences changes or every one of those uh, pixels or touch pixels, but the point is, could the person consciously distinguish them? And if the answer is yes, then it requires, it must require a distinct physical state to specify that conscious state. And if we're assuming that consciousness is created by the brain, then that has to be the case. Now, of course, this harks back to my earlier video that shows that consciousness actually cannot be produced entirely by the brain. But this is a new and independent proof that talks about why the brain cannot be a digital computer. So 200,000 bits per frame is our bit length L. Let's move on. All right, so to proceed further, I wanna ask a simple question. And that is, whatever that bit length is, there is some bit length, assuming that the brain produces consciousness. There is a minimum bit length required to specify the information obtained through my five senses in any given conscious frame. If this L is yours, this is whatever you know bit length is required for you. Everyone may be just a little bit different. Can your current conscious state be determined or created entirely from the specification of a single L? In other words, a single string of bits of length L that specify all of your stimuli and your five senses at this moment. Is that enough to determine your conscious state at this moment? And I'm going to show you why the answer is no and why it matters. So let's go back to this original idea. Now let's say at time T zero, it's the same. Watching a sunset while hearing crashing waves while tasting white wine, while smelling whatever it is you're smelling and feeling the sand under your toes. Compare that situation. Compare how you would feel at T1 if instead of this T0, there was some T0, we'll call it T0 prime, and that was the same as T1. This isn't complicated, this is very easy. My point is this, let's say at T0, you're watching the sunset, enjoying your time on the beach, and you're tasting red wine. And then in the next moment, T1, it's exactly the same, right? That would be your experience at T1 would have a certain flavor to it, if you will. You are engaged in thought, you're observing the world, you're enjoying the world, but as you're sipping the wine, there's no inconsistency. You're just tasting red wine, right? But now compare it to this alternate situation where at T0, you're having all of these sensations, but you were drinking white wine, you okay, baby? You're drinking white wine, and then in the next moment, you're now tasting red wine. Well, you have to admit that that experience at T1, remember T0 is already long gone. That experience at T0 is already gone. You have to admit that your experience at T1 would be very different than your experience at T1 had this been your preceding moment, right? Because here, you go from T0 prime to T1, everything's fine, you're just enjoying the moment you're sipping red wine. But if you went from this to this, what was actually happening is you were sipping white wine, because you maybe prefer white wine, and then at T1, you're tasting it and noticing, oh, it's red wine, you hate red wine. Well, you would feel shocked, surprised, weirded out. You would have lots of feelings that would be very different from if this were your preceding stimulus frame, right? What that tells us, at least for this example, is that a conscious experience is history dependent. It depends on previous conscious states. Now, how many does it depend on? That's where we're gonna go next. But to really drive home the idea that this conscious state is history dependent, a moment ago I asked you, can your conscious state at this moment be determined by a single string of L bits? This already tells us that the answer is no. But let's compare it to a movie. So they used to have things called DVDs. I know watchers may not even know what those are because uh, you stream everything now. I still have some DVDs, but the idea is that a DVD, well, setting aside whether it's a DVD or not, a movie in its compressed form, a two hour movie, might take something like five gigs of information. 
Well, five gigs of information is significantly more than the information required for one frame of the movie, right? One frame of the movie is gonna require way less information. So the entire history of the movie, hear me out, is necessary to be on that DVD or in that file in order to watch the video. So imagine if you're at the end of a movie, that last scene of a movie, and let's say that that was the only thing that you watched. You okay, baby? Here, let's bring it up. And let's say that that scene was the only scene that you watched. Well, it wouldn't make any sense, right? If you've never seen the movie before and you just watched that last scene, that scene doesn't really mean much to you because any series of plots or any series of visual and auditory information, which is what a DVD holds, could have led to that same last scene. But if instead you had watched the entire movie, when you're at that last scene, which is produced by a single string of bits that has visual and auditory information in it, the way you feel, your conscious experience at that last scene, which is produced by that single string, is actually a very complex experience that depends on every scene you saw before in the movie, right? That last scene, the way you feel, the way you experience that last scene is history dependent. It depends on the history of all of the preceding scenes made up of visual and sound information in that movie, which is to say that in order to produce that movie, you can't just produce the last scene. You have to produce the entirety of it. To watch it, you have to watch the entirety of it, even though you'll have a particular experience, a, sp a particular conscious experience at that last scene, but it wasn't produced by just the information in that last scene. It was produced by all of the preceding information you got in order to get to that last scene. This is just an analogy to show you where I'm going with this. Okay, so we already know from this one example that this requires L number of bits to specify the stimulus information for you to have a conscious ex conscious experience. This also requires that number. So instead of L, we have double the length in order to specify your feeling here because it depends on how you felt here. Well, now what if we do sort of the same thing, except we take these two and then create, let's say that T2 and T3 are the same as T1. Well, by the same logic, what's necessary to specify the uh, state T3 relative to state T2 is not L bits, but for the same reason, two L bits. But now notice that what if these two are the same as, how would you experience T3. Well, if T3 is soon after T1, you're probably still sort of weirded out by, you know, the, the feeling that you're experiencing, you're drinking red wine now. Maybe you're thinking about, oh, was, you know, did someone play a prank on me? Or, you know, did I, was I just, you know, dreaming or imagining or something like that, right? But now imagine, and we already know that to specify, and I should have written this before, that if this takes L and this takes L, then actually your conscious experience at here requires both of those together, requires two L. And then the same for here, for the exact same reason, your experience here depends on this. So this also requires two L. But now you can imagine, what if you took this entire piece and put them before this? So really it's not T2 and T3 anymore. It's T, say, minus two and minus one. These precede this. Well, now you can imagine that your experience here is very different than what you would have experienced had it come later because you don't have that surprise feeling. So the point is because this and this have an order that matters because your conscious perception in this case at T1 depends on not just this, but also how you felt here, which depended on how you felt there, then you can see that no, to specify the information here, it's not just L, it's now 4L. So I wanna make this just a little bit clearer. I'm almost there. So let's go back to when it was like this. So if your conscious experience at T3 depends on T2, which it does, but if that experience here also depends on the order with which these two are relative to these two, then that means that this piece depends on whether this is before or after. So that means that your experience here actually depends on the history of all of these, so that to specify this requires at least four L bits. Now the thing is, you can just keep doubling this and make the exact same argument every time. And the reason is, so let's say now I have another set T4 through 
T7, that's a group of four, and then we compare it to this group of four. Well, how a person feels here, which we know depends on those preceding conscious states, is a distinct conscious state by itself. And the way the person feels at T7 is a distinct conscious state that depends on everything that happened before it. And the way that one feels at T7 also depends on its order relative to the other groups of four. And then you make the same argument for groups of eight and 16 and so forth. So this is key, recognizing that the way one feels here depends on the preceding experiences here, but the way that one feels here also depends as a whole on its ordering relative to other groups of four. But then now you can group this into sets of eight and create another set of eight. So that would be T8 through T15. And then the same argument applies. The way you feel here depends on the ordering of all the preceding uh, stimulus frames. And the way you felt here depended on all those preceding stimulus frames, but the way you feel here also depends on its relationship to T7, whether it comes before or after, because you would have a distinctly different experience if this group happened before that preceding group. And so that's true for every grouping, a grouping of eight, a grouping of 16, a grouping of 32, and on and on and on. And so what that means is that in order to specify the information necessary to create this conscious experience here from the stimulus frames that that person has experienced requires not just L bits, but L bits for every preceding stimulus frame. You cannot experience a conscious state at T15 without having the history of those previous conscious experiences. Now, what is key though, is what I'm not arguing. I'm not arguing that this requires memory of any form. Now that's key. When you're at T15 and having that conscious experience, it does not require that you remember whether this event happened before this event. That's irrelevant. You may have already forgotten about it. What matters is the conscious distinguishability. If at this point, you could have consciously distinguished the order of these preceding three stimulus frames. If that's true, then to specify this stimulus frame requires at least that 4L. But you can make that argument for, for every one of these. So if your experience at T15 depends at least in some degree on the ordering of these previous experiences, if that was the result of consciously distinguishable stimulus frames, then it has to be that the order of every single one of these actually matters. So in order to experience whatever you experience at time T15 requires a conscious history that maps backward in time, and each one of those was produced by a minimum L number of bits to produce the information for those stimulus frames from the five senses. So that is the argument that in order to produce this conscious state, which at this moment is sort of like the end of a particular movie, you can't just provide L bits. It requires having provided all of those preceding bits in order to get to that experience. So all we're gonna do is just multiply it out. What's the total number of bits necessary to physically specify the conscious state produced here by this stimulus frame? The answer is not L, and it's not 2L. It's L times the number of consciously distinct stimulus frames that you've experienced over your lifetime. Once again, I'm not arguing or claiming that all of that information is in your brain or that you remember it all or you could remember it all. Of course not, you forget it and, and, and that information may not be in the brain. My point is that in order for it to be the case that the brain is a digital computer that produces your consciousness, it must have physically distinct states that correspond to consciously distinct states so that you can consciously distinguish things. It is not possible, it's not possible, here's a brain in some particular state, it is not possible for that particular brain at that moment to produce different conscious thoughts. That's, uh, uh, what do they call it in philosophy? That's uh, dualism, that's just saying, well, there's a soul. And you may believe there's a soul, but what I'm trying to argue here is that the brain is not a digital computer, 
which means that a given physical state of a brain cannot produce more than one conscious state. If there's a distinguishable, if there are two distinguishable conscious states, I can distinguish them. There must be some underlying state of the brain that also is distinguishable for that to be the case. But what I'm showing right now is that the total number of potentially distinct conscious states exceeds the number of neurons in the brain, but also the estimated information capacity of the brain. And how do I do that? Well, all you do is you take this L, which we already know was something on the order of 100 or 200,000 bits per frame, and we multiply it by the number of frames that one experiences over the course of a life. Now, people have lived to 120 years old, but let's just say a human life is uh, 100 years. Well, when you do the math, if you assume 10 distinct frames per second, now it, it probably is more than that, but to be very conservative, it's 10 frames per second, then what that gives you is about 31.5 billion stimulus frames over the course of a lifetime. Now, in order to specify the conscious state, that last conscious state at the end of 100 years, requires that the brain have a certain number of distinct conscious states corresponding to distinct physical states of the brain. So all I'm gonna do is just multiply this number of frames by L. So if L is uh, 200,000, you just multiply it by 200,000 and you get on the order of six quadrillion, which is six times 10 to the 15th bits. This is a conservative estimate. In order to live a human life, to have those conscious experiences, there must be brain states that correspond to those distinct conscious experiences that all depend, remember, on the ordering of them, which means a rough back of the envelope calculation says that the only way that can be the case if the brain is a digital computer is if it can accommodate at least six quadrillion bits. So six quadrillion is six million billion bits of information. Now remember that we already know that there's something like a hundred billion neurons. Well, this number is hugely larger than that by a factor of 60,000 bigger. So we know then I've shown that the brain cannot be a digital computer with neurons acting as bits. However, most neuroscientists and computer scientists don't actually think that's how the brain works, but rather if a typical neuron has something like a thousand synaptic connections with other neurons, and each of those synapses can have strengths that are physically distinguishable over the course of uh, have, having gradations that can be represented in the information of eight bits, then when you multiply it out, you get that the brain can at best accommodate information of only about one quadrillion bits. Oh yeah, so the 100 billion neurons, thousand synapses per neuron, and then eight bits per synapse gives you about one quadrillion bits. What I've calculated, and by the way, this is a very aggressive number or assumption. What I've calculated is that if the brain is a digital computer, the number of distinct physical states required to be able to create the number of distinguishable conscious states that we know are possible, that information is represented by a minimum of six quadrillion bits, which is almost an order of magnitude greater than what's actually believed that the brain holds. I think this is very good evidence that the brain cannot be a digital computer. Now, again, I'm not sure how many scientists are proposing or believe that the brain is actually a digital computer. We know that it's massively complicated, but to know that it is not, that it can't be, by actually counting the number of possible distinguishable conscious states and comparing that to the number of possible physical states the brain could have if it is a digital computer, by showing that, we can be certain that the brain is actually not a digital computer. That's it, I think it's fascinating. Did you enjoy that puppy?